Good morning. Welcome to worship. Welcome to those gathered. Welcome to those at home. I can see by looking at the crowd what really scares people away from church. And it's not COVID, is it? It's ice and snow and... Well, I don't blame you if you stayed safe at home, but I'm glad you're joining in, and I'm glad that all of you were brave and drove the roads here, drive safe on the way back, too. Uh, We don't have nursery today. Bags are in the back. Presbyterian Women meets Tuesday, February 16th, and I'll be presenting. Um, Fit and fall classes are going on. They've resumed, so that's that's a really great way to gather. Um, Fit and fall, they meet right in there, Tuesdays and Thursdays uh, at 10. The playground project, I don't know the exact number, but you all have been very generous, and I think we're almost there. So this is probably the last you'll hear from me about it. If you still want to give, you can, but we're we're getting pretty close, and I just want to say a big thank you. Thank you to everybody who gave to that, uh, and I'm just excited for you to see it and to see all the kids play on it. Lastly, Ash Wednesday services are happening this Wednesday, February 17th at 7 p.m., So Wednesday, 7 p.m., right here in the sanctuary, we will gather. We will do the imposition of ashes. Uh, I will wear a mask, and I will use a a Q-tip, a a fresh Q-tip for each person. But if you're still not comfortable with that and you want ashes, we'll have uh, a few little cups so that you could, if you wanted, impose your own ashes. So we're going to meet for Ash Wednesday, Wednesday, 7 p.m. I hope you'll join us, and we're going to do it as safely as we can. With that... Let's come together in a time of prayer, and we'll close by praying the Lord's Prayer together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for gathering us, and we thank you for the snow, for uh, the silence that it brings to our neighborhoods, for the water that it brings to our gardens and our fields and our lakes and rivers. We pray, Lord, that you would join us this morning, that you would unite us together, those who are here with those who are at home that you would open our hearts to hear your word and be shaped by it. We lift up to you all those who are in need, all those who are suffering, grieving, sick. Lord, we pray that you would be a help in time of need and that this church and each of us individually would be your hands, your feet, and your mouth. We lift up to you the family of Barbara Priest who grieve for her, We pray for Sid Fleischman and his wife, Sylvia, who are old friends of this congregation. Sid was placed on hospice, so we pray for him, that you would comfort him, give him peace and freedom from pain. Be with his wife as she cares for him. May they hold fast to your promises and take joy and hope at the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We lift up all these things, all the burdens of our own hearts, the silent, unspoken needs that we carried with us into this room or that we're carrying at home. We lift them up, we give them to you, and we pray that for this hour you would focus our hearts and our minds on you alone. We pray this in Jesus' name and pray as he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
his wounds have paid my ransom. Let's have the children come forward for the children's sermon. Madeline, you're not on. How about now? Is that better? All right. Well, I'm so glad that you guys are at church today. What is your favorite part about church? Do you guys have a favorite part about church? Bradley, what's your favorite part about church? Learning about God. Yes, Joseph, what's your favorite part about church? Sunday school. Miss Sela, what's your favorite part about church? When we're doing the games in Sunday school, those are fun, aren't they? What about you, Lucas? Oh, I don't, I don't know if there is. Are you hoping for a party? Yeah, she did. Oh, my goodness. Well, I think we'll have a pretty fun little... Uh, party in Sunday school today. Yeah, is that your favorite part? Well, did you guys know that when Jesus was a little boy, he went to church? It's true. And then when he grew up, he went back to the churches to teach. And today in Sunday school, we're going to learn about a really special church that King Solomon built. How cool is that? So let's say a little prayer and thank God that we have these churches and these places that we can come to worship God and to pray. Should we? Okay, let's do it. Father, we thank you that we are able to come together, whether it's in this physical church building or online with our church family. We thank you that we have places and means of gathering to worship and pray. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen.
Now is our time for confession. We take this opportunity to be honest with God and to admit our faults, the ways we've fallen short, and we do this knowing that He loves us and is ready to forgive and cleanse us. God is like a loving parent. We are God's children. As a child runs to a mother's lap, so we approach God with prayer, asking that our sins might be forgiven. O oh God, whose glory is always to have mercy, be gracious to all who have gone astray from your ways and bring them again with penitent hearts and steadfast faith to embrace the unchangeable truth of your word. Jesus Christ, your Son, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Jesus Christ offered himself an atonement for all sin. United to Jesus Christ in faith, we draw near to God as new creations. In Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Please be seated. My wife's not in the room anymore. She's teaching, so I can share this with you. But in my house, we play good cop and bad cop, and I'm never the bad cop. I'm always the good cop. You know, our house is, is like, you know, that stereotypical scenario when the kids are getting in trouble, and the stereotype is the mom says, just wait till your father comes home. Well, in my house, it's the opposite. And the line is, just wait till your mother comes home. Because then you know you're going to pay the consequence. And I bring this up because the scripture, the passage for this morning from the Psalms is the vision of God appearing to bring judgment to the home. God appearing as, as king, as judge, with anger against sin. And this vision of, of God coming to bring judgment, I just can't help but think of Sarah. Because it does, it strikes fear into the hearts of my kids. And you know what? She wouldn't be offended by that. She'd be proud of it. It's good. Well, I think we're a good pair. I think it works. I think our routine hopefully works out. We'll see, right? But here's the scripture. God appears as the righteous judge. Psalm, 50, chapter, uh, Psalm chapter 50, verse 1. The Lord, the mighty one, is God, and he has spoken. He has summoned all humanity from where the sun rises to where it sets from Mount Zion, the perfection of beauty. God shines in glorious radiance. Our God approaches, and he is not silent. Fire devours everything in his way, and a great storm rages around him. He calls on the heavens above and earth below to witness the judgment of his people. Bring my faithful people to me, those who made a covenant with me by giving sacrifices. Then let the heavens proclaim his justice, for God himself will be the judge. This is the word of the Lord. So keep in your mind this image, this vision. 
from the Psalms of God radiant with light, shining bright, burning with fire to be a judge. But now we're going to turn to someone who's not exactly the revered Christian sage, but I like him anyway. His name is George Carlin. George Carlin used to say that religion is the most fantastic story ever created. He said, you have to marvel at religion. And he asked, you know, think about how amazing it is that religion has convinced people that there's an invisible man who lives in the clouds, who watches everything you do. And this invisible man who lives in the clouds and always sees you has 10 rules. And if you break any of his 10 rules, then the invisible man will send you to a place with fire and burning and sulfur and torture and misery forever with no hope of escape. But he loves you. He loves you. He loves you and he needs money. He's all wise, all powerful, he says, but somehow just can't handle the buck. Now, George Carlin didn't make that up out of whole cloth. He didn't invent that idea of religion. He saw it. And we could say that it's a caricature, and that would be true, but a a caricature has to have some similarity to the real subject, or it's not an effective caricature. And I think that what George Carlin describes is not really that far off from what a lot of people actually believe. In some places, Jesus is offered or sold, we might say, as a get out of hell free card. And the sales pitch works something like this. All of us, all of us deserve hell forever. But if you accept Jesus into your heart, then God will accept Jesus' suffering on the cross as a replacement or a substitute for your suffering forever in hell. And so you don't have to go and you get to go to heaven. That doesn't sound that unfamiliar, does it? But it's essentially what George Carlin described. But it's not biblical. It's not what we believe. And if you never thought that, then I'm so happy for you. Don't. Don't start. If you never thought that, don't. But if you did, don't be afraid to change. Just because that's what you were given at some point in your life doesn't mean that you have to stay with it forever. Especially not when you hear something better and more biblical. Now, there's a rumor going around that I don't believe in hell, and that's not true. I sure do believe in hell, and Jesus talked about hell. He talked about hell a lot. And judgment, and the Bible talks about judgment. And it's not that I don't believe that God judges. Now, the alternative extreme to George Carlin's absurd, vulgar story is this idea of a God who's just nice, all the time nice, and of a care bear in the sky who is nice to us and just wants us to be nice and never holds anyone accountable. It's sort of the the spineless, the spineless hippie God versus. George Carlin's God. And if those are our two choices, I don't know what, what we're left with. Neither of them are any good. Neither of them are really believable. So what we need is a vision of God's judgment and love that's believable by a grown-up, but that is not so spineless that it doesn't have any accountability, any responsibility for sin. And there is such a vision. And what is that vision? Well, Jesus says that there will come a time when God will judge and he will separate the wheat from the chaff. And of course, the chaff goes into the fire. Jesus talks about a place where we will all be held accountable. And none of us, he says, will get out until we have paid the last penny. Jesus talks about judgment and hell. And the dominant metaphor, though, that the Bible uses to talk about the judgment of God, you saw it in the psalm, and you'll see it here in the scripture, is fire. Hebrews 12, 29 says, our God is a consuming fire. And that image, that metaphor, runs throughout the scripture as uh, a manifestation, a way of thinking about God's judgment as a fire, a fire that burns and purifies and refines. That's what God's judgment is. 
God's judgment is a fire. And the earliest teachers of the church developed this. So Gregory of Nyssa says, Our God is a consuming fire by whom all the material of wickedness is burned away. So judgment, the judgment of God is a fire. And it burns away sin. Just as a refiner's fire burns away the impurities from a metal. That's how judgment works. But notice that the meaning of this fire metaphor, it tells us something important about what God's judgment is and how it works. It's not retribution. God's judgment is not retribution. It's not an eye for an eye. The purpose of God's judgment is not to give tit for tat to do to you what you did to someone else. No, there's a very specific purpose, isn't there, for a refiner's fire. And the purpose is to purify to remove evil, and to leave behind only that which is good. So there's a purpose for judgment. And it's not vindictiveness or simple anger or eye for an eye retribution. The purpose of God's judgment is to purify, to purge, to refine. That has to be clear. Now, God, because he's a parent, judges with this purifying fire and he does it out of love because he values the precious metal that's been corrupted and he wants to save it and so i wish that preachers would stop saying and you've heard this before you've ever heard the saying hell is separation from god raise your hand if you've heard that before i wish they would stop it no that's nonsense no it's not hell is not separation from god that doesn't make any sense god is everywhere My children know that. God is everywhere, omnipresent. So how could you be separate from God? That's impossible. It's a a logical impossibility to be separate from God because God is everywhere. Plus, it isn't what the Bible says about hell. Very clear description in the book of Revelation describing those who are in the fires of hell. They will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb. And who's the Lamb? Jesus. So the idea of hell as separation from God is illogical. It makes no sense. It contradicts the most simple, basic tenets of good theology. And two, it it contradicts the express word of the Bible. I don't know where it came from, and I don't know why people say it. No, instead, the idea of hell is that it is the light that we talked about, the light we saw in the psalm, the fire we saw in the book of Hebrews to those who have been corrupted by sin and who will not let it go. So this is St. Isaac the Syrian in the 11th century, by the way. So I, I want to point this out. Some of you might be thinking, well, this isn't, doesn't sound like what I heard in Sunday school when I grew up. This doesn't sound like what I was taught. This isn't traditional. Well, it is traditional. It's just a tradition that's a little older than 1950s Baptist tradition. So here's St. Isaac. And he says, I say that those who are suffering in hell are suffering and being scourged by love. It is totally false to think that the sinners in hell are deprived of God's love. Love is a child of the knowledge of the truth and is unquestionably given commonly to all. But love's power acts in two ways. It torments sinners while at the same time it delights those who have lived in accord with it. In other words, this fire that is God's judgment is also God's love and it isn't withheld from anyone. The difference between those who enjoy it And those who experience it as an exterior punishment is a difference of the heart. Those who have rejected it, those who have closed themselves off to it, those who prefer their own righteousness instead of God's righteousness, experience the light and the fire of God's purifying love as a punishment. But those who are open to it, those who accept it, experience it as bliss, as delight, as the joy that is promised in the scriptures. We don't believe in a God who loves some people and hates others. I hope not. It's nonsense. 
You don't have to worry about whether God loves you or is angry with you. Because according to this understanding, this traditional understanding, this biblical understanding, God's judgment and God's love are the same thing. It's God's love that judges us. It's God's love that makes him want to purify us. Judgment is love and love is a refining fire. These are some of my favorite words from George MacDonald. He says, therefore, all that is not beautiful in the beloved, all that comes between and is not of love's kind, must be destroyed. And our God is a consuming fire. Judgment is about love. Judgment is about God's desire to see you as you were meant to be. And what God is angry with is your sin. And what God's judgment does is to purify to destroy sin and separate the sin from the sinner. This is old. This isn't new. This is real traditional teaching. So judgment and love are the same thing. And by this tradition, which goes all the way back to the beginning, heaven and hell are in a way the same thing. They are both not Hell is not God's absence, but God's presence. Heaven and hell are God's presence. And his presence is bright and shining and radiant and fiery with love. And that presence is experienced by those who accept it as bliss. And that presence is felt by those who reject it as hell. So the difference, Gregory of Nyssa tells us, between heaven and hell is in our hearts. And just as a refining fire burns up garbage and turns it into smoke what does it do to gold it makes it shine it makes it bright it makes it beautiful the difference between heaven and hell is not that where you are but the condition of your heart this is i think the only way to understand god's love and god's judgment that avoids the two extremes george carlin's vulgar absurd story And the sort of spineless hippie God who doesn't hold anyone to account. And we should avoid these two because neither one are worth believing. One is awful and vulgar and abusive and the other isn't much good. Doesn't have any teeth. Doesn't challenge us. So to look at it this way really is, I think, the only way that makes sense. Now, the only question I think that remains is those who have rejected God's love, who experience his love, his purifying fire as a punishment, can they change? I don't know the answer to that question for sure. But I do know this. I know that if those who are being chastised by the divine love can never repent, if they never can repent, then there isn't any purpose to that refining fire. If it never can result in a purification or transformation or repentance, then it's useless and pointless. Our God punishes out of love and for no other reason. Because our God, Jesus teaches us, is our Father. And not an imperfect human Father. I know they're good and bad fathers. But our God is a loving perfect father and good parents don't punish their children because they hate them because they're angry or because they want to pay them back a good father punishes their child because they love them and they want them to be better so i want to give a little summary it's really simple i know it may sound very different to you But it's simple. God's judgment is love. God's judgment is a refining fire that burns away sin and leaves behind pure gold, the true person that you were meant to be. That's what judgment is. It's love, and it's a burning, fiery love. And lastly, hell, like heaven, is not separation from God, but the presence of God and the fire of his love. You can understand this. And it might sound different from what you're used to hearing, and that's okay. That's okay. 
But those who sincerely seek the truth, when they find something that is more true, more beautiful, more biblical, are free to let go what they used to hold on to and embrace something better. It's not hard. It's not hard to understand. And it's not hard to do. This, I think, can change our hearts and the hearts of our children. Because it means that God's judgment is something that we can welcome. God's judgment is something that doesn't have to paralyze us with fear, but that we could embrace, that we could invite, that we could even hope for. In fact, George MacDonald is famous for praying and saying, God may no hell be missing that would separate me from my sins. We can ask for God's judgment because we can trust that it's out of love and that it's not to send us away forever, but to make us pure and true and beautiful as we were meant to be. This can be transformative. So many people talk as if Jesus saves us from an angry God. I don't know if you've heard this before, but this idea that Jesus died on the cross to spare us from the wrath of his angry father. It pits God the Father against Jesus the Son in such an odd way. That Jesus saves us from his dad. But that's not the picture we're given in the Bible. The other scripture reading for the, litur- for the liturgical calendar today is the transfiguration in the Gospel of Mark. That moment where Jesus is suddenly transformed and he burns, he looks radiant. He, the, the scripture says that he's whiter than any white you've ever seen on earth. Jesus glows with the light of God's fiery love. And then at the end, this is what happens. Then a cloud appeared and covered them and a voice came from the cloud saying, this is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Jesus doesn't save us from his father. The father is not wrath and the son love, but both are love. There is no father, but the father of Jesus Christ. And the father isn't like anything but his son. And the son, the scripture tells us, does nothing, does nothing except what he sees his father in heaven doing. There is no difference, there is no opposition, there is no separation, there is no confusion between God the Father and God the Son. They are one. And what Jesus reveals is not a love that saves us from the Father, but is the love of the Father. So God's judgment is his love, and his love is a refining fire. And that we can pray for, that we can welcome, that we can celebrate, that we can hope for. That's a God that we can believe in. It's a Christ-like God. The Father is seen not in wrath, but in the Son and His purifying love. Let's pray. Lord, we thank You that You've given us a God who is truly good, that You've revealed a Father who loves us through His Son who loves us, a God who judges, yes, a God who who has wrath, but not towards us, but to our sin. A God whose love burns. A God whose love is fiery. But that fire purifies us, purges us, makes us new. So, Lord, we pray for your judgment. We pray even for your wrath, because we know that your wrath is love, and your love is purifying. Make us whole. Separate us from our sins. Make us beautiful. Lord, we trust in you and we trust in your love. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us bring forth our tithes and offerings. We won't pass plates there in the back, but I invite you to take this time and reflect on how you might offer yourself to your loving God.
Lord, we know that your holy word teaches that you send rain and snow on the just and the unjust. You make your light, the sun, shine on the just and the unjust alike. Lord, give us grateful hearts. May we be not like those who take your blessings and your love for granted, but like those who are filled with gratitude and who give back out of that gratitude. We have so much. So receive our offerings and use them to proclaim the power of your burning love in Nampa, in our families, in our homes, and here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, don't let anyone say I didn't preach about love on Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day and hear the benediction. May the love of God the Father, the grace of Jesus Christ, and the fellowship and power of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen. <laughs>